This week on Wealth Track, after 40 years of sailing the world and finding big investment ideas in small, out of the way companies, great investor Chuck Royce shares the lessons learned and sea changes he's experienced. Small cap legend Chuck Royce is next on Consuelo Mac Wealth Track. Life, along with Mainstay's family of mutual funds, offers investment and retirement solutions so you can help your clients keep good going. Additional funding provided by Loomis Sales, investors seeking exceptional opportunities globally, and Wintergreen, your home for global value. Hello and welcome to this edition of Wealth Track. I'm Consuelo Mack. One of my favorite financial quotations is, the market can stay irrational longer than you can stay solvent. It is attributed to British economist John Maynard Keynes, who in his mid-30s almost went bankrupt speculating in currencies on margin. And according to his biographers, Keynes was a lifelong speculator who made and lost several fortunes. Well, the great investors we interview on WealthTrack are not speculators. They consider themselves to be disciplined, long-term investors whose first priority is not to lose money. They would never put themselves or their shareholders in serious financial jeopardy. Their second priority is to take advantage of market inefficiencies. The stock investors among them buy quality companies at substantial discounts to their intrinsic value. Of course, great investors are also subject to the irrational behavior of the market, and their performance can suffer as a result, especially relative to the market or their particular benchmark. The vast majority of our great investor guests substantially underperform the indices during the tech bubble, for instance. If they were not heavily invested in financial stocks, they also lagged during the credit bubble. And recently, they needed to be in high yield and more risky investments to keep up. Well, this week's great investor guest is a classic example. He is Charles Chuck Royce, a pioneering small cap fund manager, founder and now co-chief investment officer of the Royce Funds, where he runs multiple portfolios. Late last year, Chuck celebrated the 40th anniversary of running his flagship Royce Pennsylvania Mutual Fund. Penn Mutual has outperformed the small cap Russell 2000 index for extended periods over the decades delivering nearly 13% average annualized returns over the last 30 years versus the Russell's 10% returns. However, the fund has underperformed the Russell over the past three years. Which sectors has Royce been out of? We'll find out in a moment. But first, I asked him to share the most important lessons learned in his more than four decades of investing. The most important thing for us and the, and the firm is that the most important thing is not to lose the money. That you know, risk, uh, the met, you know, controlling risk is the single most important job. That's the hard part. Uh, that's the part that I had to learn through losing other people's money in '73 and '74, and it became a guiding principle for me. The truth is we can't control everything, but we have a very uh, disciplined approach of the stocks we buy. The balance sheet is probably the single most important thing we're looking at. We like very conservative balance sheets. We don't want to take uh, balance sheet risk. We want to take operating risk. We don't want to take the risk of the enterprise not having enough fuel to last for the operating cycle. So we sort of limit our risk by focusing on uh, on the upside, the operating possibilities, and on the downside, the balance sheet. And and yet you're saying this in in, in the small cap universe. And so, so so you know most people would say small company stocks are by their very nature risky. And you're saying, and you have discovered over the last 40 years that not necessarily so. They are risky. They're more volatile for sure. Uh, but we attempt to mitigate that. And sometimes we're successful. Not always. Maybe two out of three times. In the decline of uh, five years ago in 08 and 09, we did not feel we did a good job at all in preserving capital. How could you, in that environment, have done a better job? 
aside from going to cash? I'm, I'm just yeah, I think going to cash uh, probably would have been the only alternative. Our companies, w who were very strong balance sheets, uh, still went down a lot. So that's just the nature of the stock market. That will happen, yes. Right. Um, so th another lesson, uh, think long term. Full market cycles is how you think when mm -hmm. you're looking at, at what your expectations are. That's the hardest part for the individual to think. Um, a market cycle is a better way of measuring performance. Certainly calendar years are not the right idea. Even three years is not the right idea. So a full market cycle, you can measure it from peak to peak or uh, trough to trough is- In the market. Yeah, in the market is probably the most appropriate way. Uh, but you have to suspend your fear in the short term in order to capture the long-term performance. And, and let me ask you about that, because the, the average diversified stock mutual fund in this country, I think the average holding period is 15 months. That's not a full market cycle, no. right? No, at Your average holding period, for instance, at the Royce Funds is three to five years. No, closer to five in, in the case of our real diversified funds. Why is it five as, as, as instead of two? Or well, there's nothing magic about five, but but our turnover is about 20%, so that would indicate about a five-year holding period. Market cycles could be shorter than five, they could be longer than five. We had a long market cycle in the 2000 to 2000 and the peak in 2007, that was a seven-year market cycle. So they vary, but they're in the range of three to seven years. Five years is not a bad time frame, but we don't target, we don't target you know, a specific time, we're trying to double our money in five years um, as a rough idea. But in fact, we'd like to hold the stock for a long time, much longer than that if conditions allow. See, the, the, the third lesson, um, that, that major lesson that you've learned, is to focus on absolute returns. And of course, all of us look at our, the mutual funds that we invest in, and we're saying, how do they do versus the market? And how do they do versus their competitors? And that is how many of us judge. But you're saying not the way that you judge your performance. We, when we pick a stock, are using absolute standards. We're trying to you know, double our money in, in five years. But, but in fact, we're, we're trying to identify compounding vehicles that can compound at 15% plus over very long periods of time. That's an absolute standard. We expect to be measured ultimately on a relative basis. We know people will do it. We can't avoid that. The SEC requires us to use a benchmark. Um, however, it isn't really the standard by which we, we pick stocks. And it's not the standard by which you judge yourselves. Right. Doubling every five years, where did that come from? Uh, it's a pretty arbitrary number, but but it's in the neighborhood of of 15 percent uh, compounding. Uh, we don't have any funds that actually have compounded at 15 percent. We fall shy of that, uh, but it's the right standard for us. Let's talk about the current market and and what the investment environment is like. And and you just have described this market as an anomalous market. So, so what is so distinctive about the current market environment that, that we're operating in? The most distinctive part is the Fed's role in the economy. The Fed has determined that it will provide unlimited liquidity, uh, that it will keep interest rates extremely low, lower than we've ever experienced in this country. Uh, and we don't know the consequences of that, in fact. Um, perhaps it was a good idea, maybe it wasn't a great idea. But the side effect, the unintended consequence, is that it's encouraged and sponsored uh, the success of inferior companies. So if you had superior companies, you were disadvantaged in this particular environment. So, and, and one of the things that, that you've been quoted as saying is that it's probably been the most frustrating market environment that you've ever seen in your 40 years in the business. It's very frustrating because we have a quality bias. Uh, the quality bias runs through either specific funds, we have funds that feature dividends, we have funds that feature high quality companies, and we have diversified funds. 
all of our funds have a high, high, high piece of quality type merchandise. So these companies have been disadvantaged. They were prepared for hard times. They had the ability to do very well in hard times. But in fact, the inferior companies were able to actually get their act together, fix their balance sheet, sell a junk bond for five or six percent, uh, and, and go on. So it's not a meritocracy in the market right now, if, if kind of anything but. Exactly. A very good point. Um, it is a climate where, in fact, the inferior has prospered. So, so what do you do in a situation like that? Because now we, the, the Fed, I, you know, somebody said it's like QE, quantitative easing, infinity is what some, <laughs> someone's come right. up with this expression. Um, and it's not just in the U.S., it's also Japan is now completely sure, jumped on the bandwagon. So, you know, I, you know I, knowing there aren't too many certainties in life, especially in investing, but this seems to be kind of a certainty, it, at least for another year, another two years, that we're going to have this incredible repression of interest rates. So you don't want to, like, adapt and kind of go with the flow and say, okay, you know, let's go with more risk. Yeah, we're not going to do it. Yeah. Uh, we're betting on quality. We know as well as you can know that quality will out. Um, I do not think it's another year or two. I think we're running towards the end of this this year. Um, I No matter what happens in the jobs reports, any one day or, or headline, I do think there is a gradual and sustained improvement in the economy that will allow interest rates to go higher. I think the 10-year bond will be two and a half by the end of the year, maybe three next year. So, so the kind of certainty that you're expressing about that you think that the low, record low interest rates are not going to continue, that they're probably going to end this year, did you feel this way a year ago? I mean, you know, is, uh, you know how, how confident are you in, in your predictive abilities and, and, you know, what does that tell you about how quality companies are going to perform? Th this is been a confusing and frustrating time. It, it is, you know, we are patient investors, but we're learning new lessons in patience. And uh, we, we have to, we, we, we can think long term. That is certainly our advantage. I, we preach that that's the right approach, but we know that conditions today are not ideal for these quality companies. But this too will change. And, and the reason why that the more risky companies have have prospered, at, at least in the stock market, in this environment it is, is why? Well, they were able to fix their balance sheet. It's, it's really that simple. If they had le excess leverage, they were able to sell bonds, they were able to get financing, et cetera, in ways that probably wasn't true before that. Uh, and, and then there's this other part of this current condition it has driven investor preferences towards yield completely. Yield has become a mania. Yield is the, you know, internet bubble of, of today. So anything that looks like yield, without regard to safety, people have piled into. So, so for instance, you know, real estate investment trusts and Absolutely. master limited partnerships and utilities. And so, yes. so, so you think that, that those kinds of investments, and you're right, everybody wants to be in, just give me some income, that those investments are, are in a bubble? Sure, because people have so, dis the interest rate structure is so distorted, four or five percent looks like gold and, um, and is at that sort of nominal level. Uh, now, but what's happened, those stocks have gone up substantially and they're substantially above their sort of long-term value areas. Um, and I believe they're in a form of a bubble. So, so if I own a REIT, for instance, right now, or, or a master mm -hmm. limited partnership or utility, you're saying you I might want cautious. to take some, you'd yeah, be cautious. Yeah, I'd be cautious, yes. Right. Are there any other, uh, you know, talking about the distortions in the market, aside from th these yield vehicles and, and also that, that the more, the, the less, you know, the poorer quality, inferior mm -hmm. quality has prospered. Are, are there any other distortions that you're seeing that, uh, that are concerning to you or, or that represent an opportunity? Well, that, that's a good point. There's a whole bunch of stocks in the Russell 2000. That's our index. Right. That don't make money they lose money. About 25% of the whole index loses money. 
those stocks have been up terrifically. Um, it's not an area that we shop in. Right. Um, we shop in the other areas of companies that make money. So it is true that the companies that make money have done less well, and therefore we continue to shop in that zone. Yeah. So, so, so who's, where are you finding companies making money? I mean, where you're a value investor. Where are you seeing the greatest value in the small and mid-cap space right now? Well, it's in dear old-fashioned industrial companies, somewhat cyclical, but uh, we're having an industrial renaissance in this country, and I truly believe over the next five or ten years that that's going to continue. And, and so what kind of uh, industrial companies? Give me some examples. Well, an example could be, they're usually niche products. Uh, we, Lincoln Electric, uh, they're in the welding equipment, um, the uh, sort of steel distribution centers, all sorts of niche, very specific, usually very good return companies, somewhat cyclical, but these have been by and large ignored. Uh, they're up uh, from the bottom, right. but I believe they will go much further. So industrials, I, I know another area that's very interesting, and, and you recently started a, a financial, a small cap financial fund. Yes. But that doesn't invest in banks. Uh, Let's we get have that a few, straight, We have right? a few banks, but, right. but by and large, we're not bank, we don't see banks as a sweet spot. Banks are recovering. Uh, it's just not an area of expertise. They're too difficult to analyze. They're too complicated. Even banks themselves can't analyze themselves. So we, we more or less skip that. Our financial services fund focuses on everything else uh, from asset managers to insurance companies to insurance brokers to data providers to service providers and it's an important sphere in the economy with lots of ways to do it other than banks. When I look at there's a vast array of Royce small cap funds and mid cap funds and micro cap funds so why did you pick that particular sector? I mean what was it well, it, it, it's a favorite sector of ours in all of our funds, all right. in the non-bank sense. Um, I've always had an interest in these areas, so we wanted to start it. We know it's not going to be a big fund. It's a very small fund. It's a $20 million fund, right. and it's been $20 million for a long time. Uh, there's not a real big interest in this kind of thing, but it's an important part of this economy. Um, it's important in lots of different ways. I like the sort of non-asset intensive uh, vehicles uh, like insurance brokers or, or asset managers. Um, these are favorites. You know, Chuck, it, it, the markets uh, have changed a lot in 40 years. And I'd, I'd like to talk about some of the, the, the major ways in which the markets have changed. And, and, and how, if it has at all affected the way that you invest and the way that we should be investing as well as individuals. So to talk to me a little bit about the pace and the, the fact that it's this global market now. Sure, the biggest, well, it is global and that's a big change. And that certainly wasn't true in the 70s or even in the 80s. Right. But even before that or around the same time, the New York Stock Exchange began to change and we have gone away from a central market specialist system where the specialist had a fiduciary obligation to provide capital. Uh, we've gone into a different kind of market and that's a huge change. We now have high frequency traders. We now have markets all over the world. Right, uh, and trading, off exchange trading. Trading the same stock. Right, so, so does it make it, a, a lot of people feel that it makes it less safe. Do you feel less safe in the markets now? I, I think safe isn't really the right issue. I think short-term volatility is, and that, of course, makes people feel anxious and, I guess, less safe. Uh, lots and lots of daily volatility, uh, high daily volatility, it's about the same in the long-term monthly or quarterly volatility, but daily volatility is higher. The, we now trade in increments of a penny. Uh, and there, it isn't clear when you're buying stock how much you can buy at any one penny. So there's, in some weird way, there's less information. And we think of more modern markets as providing more information. But in the, in the case of trading New York Stock Exchange 
stocks, you actually are just sort of flying blind often. So it, it, are there any other major changes that, that really that have affected you as an investor and what you do as an investor? Well, the biggest change for us is the imposition of indexes. That started in the late 70s, but really took hold in the, in, in the 80s and 90s. So Thank you, Jack Bogle. <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, so we now have to compare ourselves against indexes. And, you know, that's okay, but it's not our favorite idea. Indexes are, you know, now a big part of the market. And part of that, and then have come passive investing, and then has come ETFs. ETFs in the last 10 years have just zoomed off the planet. Uh, at the same time, active managers have done less well, perhaps encouraging more passive investing. So we're in a kind of vicious cycle that investors think ETFs are the you know, path to glory. Right. Um, and that active management no longer works. So I hope that's not true. So small cap companies, which, which, I mean, you essentially created it, small cap companies, as an asset class, as a distinct asset class. So remind us again, what does do investing, does investing in small cap companies do for us as investors? What does it add to our portfolio? Well, great question. Uh, these are small. It's a huge universe. It's a universe of trillions of dollars. So the small asset, small asset class is not small at all. Lots and lots of stocks, five, six, 7,000 domestic stocks, 30,000, 40,000 internationally. Very large universe. In an ideal way, it should provide higher returns and provide it in a non-correlated way. It doesn't do it all the time, but it does do it most of the time. Non-correlated to large cap? Yes. It should have a different performance scheme. Um, and sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. But in an ideal world, it's performing differently. And just let me ask you, so, so has it, for instance, we, we've had a highly correlated market during the financial crisis. There's more dispersion mm -hmm. in results now. So are, are we back to, to a situation where the small cap stocks are actually not that correlated to the large cap stocks? Not really. Okay. It, they've been more correlated recently. However, the performance in that sector in 1, 3, 5, 10, 15, 20 has been stronger than large cap. That's a pretty long period of time. I'm not saying it goes on forever. I do think there'll be natural rotation where there'll be plenty of times in a three or five year period where large caps do better, but small caps have so many advantages that it is not surprising that they've had superior performance. Now, on the correlation, we are in a period of higher correlation. This cliche of risk on, risk off has affected everything, um, small caps included, but I do think over time they will start to separate their performance pattern. One investment for a long-term diversified portfolio, what should we all own some of in a diversified portfolio? Well, I, I'm going to give a similar answer I did last year, a, a non-asset intensive asset manager, Alliance Bernstein. Why? It has a superior diversified uh, portfolio of, of products. Uh, it pays a high yield. Um, and it, it's structured as a yield product, um, and they have excellent management. And is that in your new financial services fund? Absolutely. Chuck Royce from Royce Associates, thank you so much for joining us here at Fabulous Ocean House. Thank you. At the conclusion of every wealth track, we give you one suggestion to help you build and protect your wealth over the long term. This week's action point is consider owning some high quality small cap stocks, both U.S. and international, in your portfolio. As Royce explained, there are thousands of small cap stocks traded here and overseas. Many of the higher quality ones dominate their business niche, are conservatively run, and pay dividends. Considering that some 25% of the Russell 2000 companies lose money, this is probably one asset class where buying an index fund isn't the best route and going with a proven active manager is. 
An incremental approach also makes sense since small cap stocks as a group have far outpaced their large cap brethren in recent months. Well, next week we will have another television exclusive. This one with financial thought leader Charles Ellis. Charlie will share his 50 years of investment consulting wisdom, highlights from his new book, What It Takes, Seven Secrets of Success from the World's Greatest Professional Firms. If you have missed any of our great investor or financial thought leader guests, you can find them on our website, wealthtruck.com. You can also see additional and extended interviews in our WealthTruck Extra feature. In the meantime, thank you so much for taking the time to visit with us. Have a great week and make it a profitable and a productive one. New York Life, along with Mainstay's family of mutual funds, offers investment and retirement solutions so you can help your clients keep good going. Additional funding provided by Loomis Sales, investors seeking exceptional opportunities globally. And Wintergreen, your home for global value.